Welcome to episode 177 of Stageworthy. I'm your host, Phil Rickaby. Stageworthy is a podcast about people in Canadian theatre featuring conversations with actors, directors, playwrights, and more. So last week I got some, some great news. It turns out that I will be presenting my solo play, The Commandment, at the Toronto Fringe Festival this year. Uh, my director, Richard Bone, uh, was on the waiting list and uh, our, our turn came up and uh, we were able to uh, to take it. And uh, so that's, I'm really looking forward to that. I, I have not, I did, except for a, a single performance of this that I did before I went out east last year, um, I have not been able to perform this show in Toronto. So I'm really looking forward to uh, to doing this at the Toronto Fringe this summer. And so I hope that you will you will come out and, and, and see it. And of course, um, I'm sure that we'll, I'll be talking about that a bit more as we get closer to the date. Speaking of Fringe, make sure that you are subscribed to Stageworthy because as we get closer to Fringe, you'll be hearing more and more from different Fringe artists. Pretty much all of the episodes that you'll hear in June every week will be uh, interviews with fringe artists of different types. So you can look forward to that as well. Remember that I will also be doing my fringe roundups each Saturday of the Fringe Festival. We'll be gathering a group of fringe artists together to talk about fringe. We'll talk about the first few days at the on the first Saturday. And then when everybody's really exhausted, we'll talk about how the fringe has been going on the last Saturday of fringe. So I really love those conversations and I hope that, uh, that you will uh, uh, stick around for those uh, during the Fringe Festival. I want to talk uh, for a second about Today Takes, as I as I often do. Remember that Today Takes is an app and website that offers easy and affordable access to a wide variety of must-see cultural performances, from plays and musicals to dance, opera, comedy, immersive experiences, and beyond. Let's take a quick look at the Today Takes app to see what they have this week. Uh, there are tickets to Second City's new show, Walking on Bombshells. I see Soul Pepper's Copenhagen, and okay, <laughs> a ten dollar tickets for uh, Shove It Down My Throat at Buddies and Bad Times. There are also great prices on The Little Prince Reimagined, which I am hearing nothing but raves for. So that's something that, that you'll probably want to check out. I really want to check it out. So uh, uh, buying tickets on Today Ticks is a, is a is a great opportunity to see that. Remember that Today Ticks makes ticket buying simple, and you can purchase tickets in less than thirty seconds. Get it on iOS and Android, or go to todayticks.com. I mentioned subscribing, and if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, I really hope that you will. It's super easy to do. Just uh, just look up Stageworthy uh, on your podcast app. If you have an iPhone, just go to podcast, search Stageworthy, and click subscribe. And you know what? You do the same on your Google device. If you have an Android phone, go to Google Music, or if you're one of the lucky few that has the Google Podcast app, search for Stageworthy, and you will find it there. And just click on subscribe, and every episode will be delivered to you each week without you having to do anything. If you want to drop me a line, remember that you can find Stageworthy on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at StageworthyPod, and you can find the website at StageworthyPodcast.com. If you want to drop me a line, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Phil Rickaby, and my website is PhilRickaby.com. My guest this week is Lucas Penner. Lucas is an actor and composer based in Toronto. He's presenting his dark reimagining of Dante's Inferno, Circles, in concert April 4th, 11th, and 18th at the Lula Lounge in Toronto. So Circles is a musical based on Dante's Inferno set in an open mic in hell? That's right. Okay. Yeah. So where did this come from? Uh, I, well, the Dead and Lovely Collective mm -hmm. um, it was a band of people from my theater school at George Brown. Um, Former George Brown, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a big group of us. Uh, and we, we did a cabaret oh, yeah. at the central, um, where Honest Ed's used to be, yeah, right yeah. on Markham, our Markham there. Yeah. And, 
my whole thing has been like I come from a singer songwriter band background, and then yeah. theater started happening. Uh, where I did some music theater, and mm-hmm. then uh, did just like George Brown theater, mm-hmm. and uh, have since been like trying to figure out what my thing is, what it, what my uh, artistic, what I'm trying to say, and yeah. how I'm trying to say it. Mm-hmm. And that's the closest that I got is uh, with that group of people okay. um, doing this little cabaret. We were mm-hmm. doing like a bunch of pop songs, Tom Waits songs. Like the Dead and Lovely Collective is a big tip of the hat to Tom Waits there. Sure, yeah. Uh, his song, Dead and Lovely. And uh, it just went great. And I just went, I have to do more of this. And uh, that wasn't a fully original score. So Circles is the next time around. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kept finding that Dante's Inferno uh, was coming up in things that I was watching mm. or things that I was reading. Mm-hmm. Like uh, I was reading Frankenstein by Mary Shelley and it's referenced there. Yeah. Um, also, I'm uh, I, I'm into like manga and anime. So yeah. uh, uh, Full Metal Alchemist, it yeah. comes up quite a bit too. Um, and it's just a... Mm-hmm. And then I started looking at the, the text itself and mm-hmm. just it's a fascinating, um, really old piece of literature that fits like there's so much stuffed into the inferno yeah um and i love this like the nine circles of hell thing like yeah. organizing hell into something like that and then everyone's getting tortured in very specific ways to their sin mm-hmm. um yeah and then uh so i decided to do that we and we put it up at uh, the cameron house the first time mm-hmm. and it was an insane process of like we had a small production crew mm-hmm. um it was myself, uh, Patrick Warren, and Justine Christensen. Mm-hmm. And uh, we uh, basically, between the three of us, uh, conceptualized the thing. And then I started composing, and Justine and I were working on the script, and Patrick was dramaturging. And uh, from concept to realization, it was about three months um, of a like very big work. Yeah. And uh, that's rehearsal all of it. Three months is pretty fast. Yeah, it was insane. That's fast. Yeah, it was it was too fast. So <laughs> there's there's a there's a lot more space here. Yeah. But, but we really um uh really struck some gold, I mm. feel, with the with the songs and the concept yeah. and I just really believe in the project and I'm mm-hmm. wanting to take it further and uh so here we are. Yeah. And so you're doing um you three dates? Yes. Three dates. Three, oh, three holy Thursdays in hell. That's right. right nice, yeah. nice. Um, and that's at the Lula Lounge in April? That's yeah. right. So, um, and what, what, and this is, is it, is it fully staged? Is it, um, sort of a reading? Like how, how is that? Do you know yet? How that's this is a, you? we're calling it a concert version. Sure. Yeah. There is going to be a bit of, uh, there are going to be a few monologues here and there. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Um, but this is, uh, the first time around, um, we were trying to do a lot at once. Yeah. And when you're doing, I feel like when, uh, when you're doing a mu- new musical or something, of, like there's so many elements to it. Yeah. And this is just an attempt to really strengthen the concept mm-hmm. and really strengthen the music. So I've uh, brought on a bunch of people that I've seen in the Toronto music scene mm-hmm. over the course of the last few years. Like, yeah. Cause I went to U of T in the classical voice program for okay. a year and I was always over in the jazz program, checking out their, their master classes sure. and stuff like that. And uh, I met some really amazing musicians mm-hmm. and have seen their, their solo projects, their group projects. Cause those people are like, they're such good players. They're playing in sometimes two, three, four, five, six bands at yeah, a time. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I've just seen these faces around a lot. And so I asked them to be a part of it. And then I did some auditions for singers. So everyone is a very strong musician in this show. Um, and, uh, we're wanting to take that as far as we can. So there's like very composed, like classical overture Mm -hmm. kind of piece. And then, uh, we're doing singer songwriter stuff still. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we're trying to just get as much as we can out of the musical portion of the yeah. night. And we'll have a couple monologues and uh, the key text points to uh, give people a sense of the greater arc. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because the, the, the process of creating a musical, it's not something that you can just sort of, you can't quickly whip it up and then throw it on stage and expect it to work. 
No. You know? And it takes it takes years to for, for something like that to come together. Yeah. You know? If you look at um like some of the, the like the biggest hits on Broadway, almost none of them were like well, none of them like happened overnight. They have years of work and workshops and things like that that went into them. So it's like, you know, it takes time, but I think it it's that like time time pays off, you know. Oh, it totally does. I don't think I've ever sat with a project um, intentionally this long before. Mm. And uh, and I guess that's something that keeps exciting me about it because it mm-hmm. keeps I keep being um, fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. there's more and more avenues. It's like like I'm working on the script separately with a dramaturg right now, um, mm-hmm. Steve Vargo, mm-hmm. and. Uh, um, we're fixing a lot of the big plot holes because the the first version it was like it was great it was an awesome Mm -hmm. uh uh it was like great energy the music was fun and the story was really exciting too Mm -hmm. but there was like just too much going on all at once and it wasn't unified yeah so i've kind of tried to break things apart and working on the script separately because you know there's not enough time to really rehearse that yeah. at this point. Yeah. And like, I don't have the means to do that at this point. Yeah. So this is to like, the strong point at this point is the music. Mm-hmm. Knock that out of the park. Yeah. Working on the script separately. And then uh, I'd like to do a full production, um, you know, the next year, yeah. or maybe year and a half, two years. It's interesting because if you think about it, the way that a lot of people encounter a musical for the first time is not through the script, it's through the music. Mm-hmm. Most most times, unless you're like one of those people who goes who's really adventurous and he goes to sh- see shows on Broadway like of, before the cast album is out or anything, mm. then you're experiencing for the first time. But most of us encounter those shows because of the music, mm-hmm. and then we find out what the story is. Right. So this is kind of like your your cast album that will draw people in. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And uh, yeah, I'm trying to scrounge some money up together to actually do some recording as well because mm. it's that's the best way to give people a sense of what it is that you're making. Well, you know, I mean, and, and that kind of thing is, is super important too. If you even look at, um, do you know, do you know the, the musical Be More Chill? I've heard about yeah, that. It's about, actually, to open, yeah. it's about to open on, on Broadway or it has opened on Broadway, but okay. it had an off Broadway production, like maybe five years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. But then they did a recording of the soundtrack mm-hmm. and it caught on, mm. on like Spotify and things like that. And now, like it got this huge following, which was able to propel it to to Broadway. So it was the the, the power of the soundtrack that got it, that made it go forward. Because as far as most people were concerned, without that, it was dead. It had its run. It was over. Right. So it's like it can be a really powerful thing. Hmm. Um. Well, and the neat yeah. thing about sorry to interrupt. You no, know, no, yeah. But the neat thing about this is like uh, the whole pursuit of Dead and Lovely, the mm. the collective, is to. Um, start bringing genres and uh uh styles of music that aren't usually put on stage Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh so like my background i grew up listening to a lot of tom waits Mm -hmm. and uh you know ben harper um elliot smith jeff buckley Mm -hmm. and uh uh, all that sort of stuff and i didn't really see that represented in uh musicals very Mm -hmm, often mm -hmm. and um so uh, the, the whole the whole like premise of circles as well is like it's an open mic, so everyone is conscious of their performance. Yes, and it's, yeah. we're we're not really using music to um, directly speak to each other. I mean, mm. things get a bit hairy at the end because yeah. Lucifer is the MC and he's kind of he's pulling the strings the yeah. whole time, mm. um, and he'll use music to speak directly to people eventually. But uh, yeah, we're. I'm I'm kind of trying to with the Dead and Lovely Collective to bring the independent music scene and mm. theater a bit mm. closer together in a way mm. that uh, feels authentic. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice. I'd like to talk for a second about your journey from primarily being a music person to how you discovered theater and decided that that was a thing you were going to go to because a lot of people don't make that transition. So. Mm. Um, what started what started that transition for you from from music to theater i think it happened really early um like it 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 didn't really manifest itself fully mm-hmm. early at all but like uh i did um when i was a little kid i was sent to a uh my mom put me in this little drama okay class and 
We did uh, Tacky the Penguin and uh, Thumbelina. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I, I played a, a hunter in Tacky the Penguin, and I was like big, boisterous kid. Yeah. I got to wear these awesome wolf slippers, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just got to yell at people. Um, and I played a king in mm. Thumbelina, and uh, there was another... I, I played a, a giant. Mm -hmm. I still remember the pants that I wore <laughs> as a little... <laughs> these look like big... Brown kind of like sweatpant <laughs> things and with big holes in them and stuff, but fee fi fo yeah. fum, you know. It's funny the things yeah. that we remember from it, from our childhood. Yeah, it's like what do you, what do you remember? I remember the pants, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> I know. I don't remember what the shirt was no. at all. I just remember those those stupid <laughs> like yeah. sweatpants. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think just that little thing, mm -hmm. and I think it was just we would just go to. Uh, this woman's house and we mm. do have these, it was a small group of kids and we do some drama games yeah. and build these narratives. And, uh, I just remember really taking to that. And mm. then, and then music was, I just fell in love with soundtracks as a kid. I remember just being like totally blown away by them, especially with star Wars, okay. like, like the Darth Vader theme uh, or the Darth Vader theme, yeah, the Imperial yeah. March. Yeah. I would get up, I was like a six-year-old kid. I'd get up and dance <laughs> when that part came on. I'd just be like conducting, uh, yeah. losing losing my mind, yeah. basically. Uh, yeah. And then uh, that kind of went away for a while. Like mm -hmm. it, that was a very, it was kind of a thing at home mm -hmm. or it was an internal thing. And I didn't really start having an outlet as a young man until uh, I was like 14. Mm -hmm. I started playing uh, guitar. Okay. So my dad forced me to, I was a shitty 13 year old and like, <laughs> um, he made me go to a rock, rock and roll camp. Yeah. You know, terrible dad, right? Making you go to rock oh, and roll camp. Oh shit, man. <laughs> oh, he made you go to rock and roll yeah. camp? Oh, shit. I hated it for the first few days. Oh, sure. But, yeah. uh, then I started really taking to it and then I started taking lessons and then it, I, no looking back at that point, I started yeah. writing songs very mm. early and then I had my first band. Uh, and then it was, uh, band centered for a while. And, and you went to, to, to U of T. Uh, yeah. Like right? I grew up in BC. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I was doing the band thing and then I started blowing my voice a lot, uh, mm. singing over drummers. Sure. Yeah. And then I started taking singing lessons mm -hmm. and the woman I was studying with, uh, also ran a, a an amateur theater company okay. and she did musicals. Mm -hmm. So I started singing. So I was in Hair and Evita and yeah. Chess. And uh, that brought the theater bug back into my life. Mm -hmm. And then I started singing classically as well. Mm -hmm. So those two things together brought me out to Toronto. And I went to U of T for the classical voice right. program. Uh, I left after a year because I didn't see myself that way, really. Mm -hmm. Like okay. I, I saw myself more as doing like... Uh, the music I wrote in my bands and okay. things like that. I, I still love singing. Like I'm still taking singing lessons yeah. classically, but uh, there was a different kind of beast that I felt my creative creativity was. Okay. Um, hmm. And then that led me to George Brown. And then George Brown, I used all of those skills that I had developed over the course of years. Mm -hmm. um, and I started music directing. Mm -hmm. We did... Uh, um, well, we, we, d we would do little scene changes and I'd play guitar for those yeah. or I'd be kind of scoring things live mm. when we were doing our period study and yeah. stuff like that. And, um, and then that just kept growing. And then they mm. asked, uh, Jake Runnicles and I, um, to, uh, music direct in third year, of or, or like co-music direct Cavalcade. And then, uh, I actually wrote some tunes for our version of As You Like It. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey Pounds It. Um, and, uh, we just took Shakespeare's text and put some music to it mm -hmm. and, and that really got me, uh, arranging things and making scores for people. And, yeah. and, uh, we did like a rock, uh, like electronic, um, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream that was like Matrix inspired. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which was totally insane, but, <laughs> uh, that stuff just, uh, brought it all together for mm. me. It just really... Yeah, it brought everything really close together. What is it that took you, like, you know, when you, you did a year at, at, at U of T, mm -hmm. and then what, 
why did you choose George Brown? Did you know when you left that you wanted to go to George Brown, or was there no? What did you? What were? What was your goal when you left the uh, the music program? Oh, I I think. I mean, to, it's it's kind of vague, but just to find what I was looking for. Mm, okay. To find to find what I uh, what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it, or mm. or I, I I felt pretty lost. Yeah. I, <clears throat> you know, like you being being at U of T in the classical voice program, it was I was pretty out of my element. Okay. Um, mm. And uh, like I, I, being away from BC, and then no, I wasn't really doing the music that I felt really passionate about. Okay. Um, what is it that like? Was it just not what you expected when you go there when you went to to that music program, or was it uh, was it the only the like classical the voice program that you that you found? I'm just curious, well, I, what sort of took you there if it wasn't what you thought right. it was going to be? Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, I didn't really. Like I, I think that I, I needed, I needed to get, I needed, I knew I needed to go. Yeah. Um, I was, I grew up in Penticton in the Okanagan. Okay. Um, loved it there, but it just felt like I got to go. I mm-hmm. got to do something else, and yeah. I don't know what it is exactly. Sure. And then it's like Toronto. My singing teacher knew about the the program there. She said okay. it's, it's really good, and I've been studying for with her for a while. And then I auditioned for there and McGill. Mm-hmm. And I got into both, but uh, I got an entrance scholarship to U of T. Sure. And uh, I knew a couple people here, okay. as opposed to Montreal. I don't think I really knew anybody. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it was a starting point. Mm-hmm. It was like, you know, because I was thinking a lot. I was thinking like, well, I mean, I could just stay here. I could do this. I could yeah. do that. It yeah. was just like, well, I'm just going to throw myself into the water sure, here yeah. and just see what happens. And well, it's interesting because now you've, you've taken yourself out of everything that you're familiar with, gone to a, a new place and you're studying something kind of new. Yeah. Which is, which is a difficult thing to do, but it's also uh, super important to, to do, I think, to take yourself out of the familiar. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you, when you left that program, were you looking at other theater schools or like, did you leave just being like, this isn't what I want. I don't know what I want. I'm trying to remember exactly what my headspace was. Mm. Cause I feel so far away from oh, sure. what, it, what yeah. it was at that point. Um, but, uh, I, I just, I guess I just, uh, I felt like I was straying from, uh, my own creativity. I mm. felt like I was not, I wasn't producing as much. I wasn't making, I wasn't writing as many songs mm. as I wanted to, or mm. I wanted to like, I wanted to gig, I think. Yeah. And uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit vague to me. It just, I just felt drawn. Okay. I just felt drawn to go. And I didn't yeah. really, like, I couldn't see very, uh, it's awesome that you have a uh, Neil Gaiman there. Yeah. Um, but uh, I just watched, his little master classes I saw I didn't I just saw he there is like the beginning the intro to yeah. like take my master class thing yeah. but he's talking about writing a novel um and you have like a very small like narrow sight line mm-hmm. and you can't see very far either yeah. so it's like you're seeing through here and you can only see like you know a kilometer in front of you yeah. maybe yeah um and uh life feels a lot like that too oh shit yeah and yeah. and uh so it was, I was just riding, mm. riding on something. And mm. I, I had a mentor, uh, Peter Wilde. When Peter I, Wilde was the head of acting at George Brown when I was there. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But he, uh, that's another reason, that's another thing that brought me up there is because my friend Mia Harris, mm. uh, she studied uh, classical voice at U of T as well. Right. Um, but she did the Zone of Silence with Peter, Uh and she just said that it was an incredible experience yeah. and she was talking about this a lot to me because mm-hmm. she lives in Penticton. Right. Um, and I just went, oh, I, I want to meet this guy. Yeah. And uh, so I came over here and then we we met, mm-hmm. uh, I think it was at Second Cup on yeah. Young. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, I showed up there while I was at U of T just like so anxious yeah. a bundle of nerves and he just stopped me and he's like you will be who you want to be with one of those like 
owl eyes, of course, stare, yes. like piercing stares course, right yes. into your face. The, the very the, it's, that's that's very Peter Wilde. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so that uh, and then I just kind of kept in touch with him because mm-hmm. he remembered Mia and uh, and then so in that year that I left, mm-hmm. we did a vocal mask together, mm-hmm. and uh, I had been talking to him about art about what I wanted to do and. And uh, then he eventually suggested George Brown that I audition okay. for theater schools because yeah. um, it sounded like, I guess, just from what I was saying about what I wanted to do, it sounded mm-hmm. like I wanted to pursue acting. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think another thing that, thinking about it now, something that drew me to uh, start doing theater is that it's funny how it ended up happening but because music became a big part of it but i wanted to strip that away i felt like i was hiding Mm, but like i was singing these songs and i didn't know what i was talking about Mm. or i I just felt yeah i just felt really disconnected from actually communicating and i saw that a lot at u of t it's like you're so focused on technique yeah and classical singing is a difficult thing sure um but you get so and like it's I think that a lot of the time it's like it, there's a time period. It's like you're working on all this technique and then it's there for you when you want to express yes. what you want to express. I was just getting really impatient and frustrated and I was like, I want to say something. Yeah. I don't, I, that's, that's the biggest thing that I want to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I just was the, the things that I was watching, I just wasn't feeling inspired. So I was in right. pursuit of that. And then I think doing uh studying uh at george brown is is it excited me because it was like i wasn't i was just going to be totally stripped bare yeah basically yeah, yeah, yeah. which ended up being horrifying and super difficult yeah of course it is and that's kind of what it's supposed to be right exactly yeah but uh and then music started becoming a thing again and it was like oh i'm i'm doing i'm doing like more music in a more diverse way mm-hmm. in theater school yeah. than i was in music school which that makes was, sense. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Like, just the fact that, like, it, through theater, um, there's so much more to explore. And nobody is... So few people are experts in theater. Because you just learn enough about whatever it is that you're working on. <laughs> right. And so, it's like, you study one thing until you know enough about that to be able to do the show. And then you yeah. have that knowledge. And at the end of, at the end of a, a certain period of time, you're like, I just know a whole bunch of shit about, like, random things. Yeah. Because you have people being like, hey, can you do a backflip or something yeah, like that? Something, you know? Yeah, I can do a backflip. Yeah. You know? But can you do a front flip? Never learn to do that. Yeah, sure. You know? Here, Just, I'll work sure. on that in the corner yeah, for yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. it's like like we, we <laughs> learn all these random things over time. So it makes sense to me that like in theater school, you would do more with music than you were doing when you were studying music. Mm-hmm. Which which campus were you at? Were you Was it at the Young Center? Young Dumpling? Center, okay. yeah. Cool. <clears throat> um... And so you, you, what was your period study period, by the way? We did uh, restoration. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. It's a, my class did the restoration as well. So oh, you did? Okay. Yeah, which is a very, um, I think we, we, we forget, because I know when I thought about restoration, I thought about the comedies. Right. And I hadn't thought about the tragedies. Right. Um, and then there were tragedies that we were doing, and I was like, this shit is kind of weird and over the top. Oh, yeah. You know, but... What tragedies the, did you do? I don't, I don't even remember. I don't think I could... I mean, this is a long time ago. I don't think I could remember a single one of those one of those plays I did. Um, we did We did All for Love. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was one of them. Uh, ooh. Oh, there was another <laughs> one that was like the, the sexy one. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. Yeah. Wow, it's funny yeah. how things just like yeah. fall out. Well, you, know? you don't need them anymore. <laughs> yeah, right? you don't need yeah, them anymore. I guess, yeah. After a certain amount of time, there's like <clears throat> like that's the stuff that's gonna go on your resume for a few years, and then all of a sudden you're gonna be like, I've got too much stuff. I don't need that stuff anymore. Gotta, like, <laughs> yeah. Take some of that stuff off and put some new stuff on there. You know? Yeah. Um, and were you like writing? At what point did you decide? Did you know that you wanted to write a musical? I didn't ever because I I kind of had an aversion to it because I I like if. I grew up listening to like Jesus Christ Superstar mm-hmm. and Miss Saigon. I yeah. love those shows, mm-hmm. but I found a lot of musicals to be pretty campy. Yeah. And I, I didn't really, yeah, I, I didn't really want to be in that. Mm-hmm. But then I kept finding, well, I mean, people kept telling me, they're like, these sound like they could be show tunes. Yeah. The songs that I was writing for myself. Yeah. 
And that, I, I didn't really know how to take that at first. I was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> screw you. I don't want to, I don't write show tunes, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm into Tom Waits and, and like Jeff Buckley and yeah. Elliot Smith and those guys. Those are my dudes. They yeah. don't write show tunes. Yeah. But then I, I really, when I was at U of T, mm. I was, um, I spent a bunch of time, like, they, they have a great library there. Mm. And I was reading um, biographies on Tom Waits and on Nick Drake mm. and, uh, uh, Jeff Buckley, Morrissey, and uh, with the Tom Waits studies, like I felt like how much he used theatrics a lot yeah. in his stuff, and he actually did it. He did it. He composed for shows. He yeah. did um, the the Black Rider. Yeah. Um, he did his like weird conceptual thing big time. Yeah. I think there. Then he did like Alice. Yeah. And uh, um, I think there's another one too, but. Uh, all of that sort of, um, and I felt in, I, I just felt this, I think it's the, another thing that drew me away from U of T or in the direction that I've gone. I just mm -hmm. had this sense of like, I love, um, like big works, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like a novel. Yeah. There's really something incredible about writing a novel, yeah. something like that. It, like you have, having to fit all of those pieces together. Cause I write a lot. Yeah. Like, I have so many books just filled with ideas mm. and I was starting to feel like, um, I was, I was drowning in my own content yeah. and, and I wasn't finding homes for these things. Mm. And I felt like a responsibility to that. Yeah. And like, I need to find a way to, uh, put all these things together somehow. And there's mm -hmm. all these little bits of songs, uh, that weren't finished necessarily. And it's like, well, maybe all these fit into something bigger yeah bigger than yeah, just yeah. like one song or uh, or an album even mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like how can we run something through and i was also finding like doing the singer songwriter shows or playing in bands i felt like there was something lacking like i wanted to be a more full kind of experience because mm -hmm. a lot of the times singer songwriter stuff i've been guilty of this you get up there you look down at oh, the yeah, ground, yeah. and then you just play your guitar and you might sound great or whatever but there's no connection there's no happening connection, yeah. you know like people are looking at your hair or yeah. the the whole time and because i mean that kind of music there's a crazy intimacy to it that's terrifying to like look at people while you're doing that. oh sure it's like, like a song because a lot of that stuff is like written from like you're writing you're saying something really personal yeah and that can be that's i think sometimes a difference between like the uh the performer and the song, the, 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 like the mm. singer songwriter. Yeah. Because the performer knows if this is really going to work, they have to see my eyes. Right. Right. And that's where the connection comes in. But that's not for everybody. No. Not everybody can, can take that. No, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. And, but there's something so beautiful about, uh, like, uh, the, the singer songwriter thing or if you want to call yeah. that alternative or yeah. whatever that's maybe a little bit less performative but yeah. there's an incredible um truth yeah to it mm -hmm. that uh i think sometimes the performative stuff lacks sure yeah and so i've been really trying to pursue like well how can you <clears throat> how can you put those two things together sure. somehow and then like biopics coming mm -hmm. out, you know, like yeah. I watched Control yeah. about Joy Division mm -hmm. and Ian Curtis and, and it's like you get to be a fly on the wall for how those songs were created or yeah. like what was going on in those people's lives yeah. while, and then they'll do a song. Yeah. And I just found that really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And like, um, uh, We Will Rock You mm -hmm. or, or Bohemian Rhapsody yeah. came out. And, uh, I think there really is something to that. So it's like, how can you, how can cre you create a context? In which we see the the songwriter as a as a character, mm -hmm. and you get to discover about their character through their music as well as uh, a narrative. And it isn't um, it's like you don't have to be as performative. I mean, it's like a, it's a tricky. It is balance, a tricky thing because mm. I think I think the uh, the idea of being performative is as much can be as much a, a barrier as not looking up yeah oh exactly it's like that's another that's another it's, it's like yeah. a way out right that's another way of not because you're putting a layer of performing performing 
like yeah. to to like the performativeness is a way of like keeping people out. So yes, you're, yeah. you're being you're act you're they can see you you're you're acting or schmacting whatever it is that you're doing, mm. but it's not a connection. Mm. The 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 most difficult thing to do is to is to is to drop that and just be yeah, which is like. Which is what's Again, scary. it's terrifying, right? Because, yeah, right? yeah. you know, sure, you kept your head down to protect yourself, and then you're like, okay, if they can see me, then it's more better to protect, but you you can't, it's f- still scary. Yeah. You know? And I've done that with, like, my solo show, the first time I did it, mm. was, um, there were a couple of lessons, like, my director had said, like, you have to, like, the audience is your scene partner, so you have to look them in the eye. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. But then learning, like, oh, you actually... A lot of this, you don't actually have to put a lot. Like, you don't have to act it. You just have to say the words, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You just have to say it. And yeah. w- everything you need to will come through. And, like, at the, at the point where you stop performing it and just, like, be it is, like, that's where you're the most vulnerable. But that's where it works the most, mm-hmm. you know? It's a difficult spot to get to, like to to go from like, okay, so I have to connect with these people and, mm-hmm. and, and not like put that barrier between us. Mm-hmm. And I guess, uh, yeah, I guess all that to say that this show is a pursuit of creating a uh, a space mm-hmm. <clears throat> for that in in a way that's very near and dear to me mm-hmm. in in a in a big way. Yeah bringing a lot of different elements together and they're like, cause I love performative stuff too. Sure. You know, it's not like I'm against. No, it can it be spectacular. Any, yeah. It can be amazing. Yeah. And, um, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is, this is like everything that I've learned yeah. to this point. Mm. Um, yeah. Now with this production, you know, these three, these three Thursdays, you have like a, a, a like a ten person orchestra. That's right. We have it's a the band is six pieces. Uh-huh. Uh, so we have uh, drums, guitar, uh, bass, uh, electric, and a double bass. Yeah. Um, uh, keys, a violin, trumpet. Yeah. And uh, our uh, our violinist uh, Quinn Dooley also sings as okay. well. She has a beautiful voice. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then we have. Uh, uh, Sydney Monteith, Chase Winicky, mm. William Alexander Doyle, and Lauren Mayer, and mm. they're they're like our lead vocalists nice. for the show. So that's ten people all together. Mm. Huge wall of sound. Like I'm in. Re- we we had a rehearsal yesterday. Yeah. We're doing um, circles hype up uh, yeah. at, at Drum Taberna on uh, Thursday. Okay. Um. So that's like another fundraiser thing. Yeah. But uh, it's an inc- like I get so excited thinking about them in Lula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lula yeah. is a, just a perfect venue for the show itself, mm. and then them taking the music as far as they're taking it. Nice, uh, yeah. Nice. There is something about mm. you know I've seen I've seen musicals where this where the 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 orchestra is recorded. Okay. Oh yeah, so, yeah. yeah. It's all canned, right? It's all yeah. canned. It's canned yeah. music. Yeah, yeah. No. And I've seen musicals <laughs> where like the orchestra is there. Yeah. And there's no comparison. No, no. There is no comparison to between the two. Like you could the audience senses it. The audience knows. Mm-hmm. That there's like even if they don't know consciously, you can feel the difference. Oh yeah. Right? Um and so that's it's awesome to have like especially that those that number of of, of instruments playing there. Mm. Oh yeah, it's yeah. It, that is a theatrical thing mm-hmm. in and of itself. Yeah. I saw uh, uh, Benjamin Hackman uh, in Toronto. He did the the Holy Gasp. He did Lo- Love Songs of Oedipus Rex mm-hmm. um, on Bathurst. Okay, and I that really hit home to me that like, oh my God, just a, an amazing band is a theatrical thing in and of itself. Because yeah. I've been kind of like worried about like, is this going to be a park and bark thing? Are people going to be bored out of their minds watching people just stand there and play music? Um, but like, if you get a an orchestra of this size, yeah. Uh, that really know what they're doing mm-hmm. and we're going to be cross genre all over the place for the entire evening. Mm-hmm. That is a theatrical thing in and of itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, what do you like, what do you hope? Is there something 
the with through these Thursdays mm-hmm. that you're tr- that you're hoping to to learn about the show or get from it, are you is this a sort of a workshop where you're learning what audiences react to, or is this more like you want to put it out there to maybe get interest so that you can take it further or both? I'd say all of those yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. I'm wanting to like I I feel. I, I feel like there's enough um, substance to this thing to, mm. to take it really far. Mm. Um, and I'd like to just honor that. And nice. so that, that that's probably the, there's a whole list that I could go off about the things that I want sure. from, from yeah, this yeah. and that like I'm excited about, but that's a, that's a big one. It's like taking, um, yeah, it's just really, cause a lot of, a lot of things, uh, like in the French festival or whatever, mm-hmm. the Canadian stuff, it just ends up popping out once and then it disappears. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm really wanting to invest. It's like, I've found something that I feel is rewarding for myself. And every time other musicians or other people are involved in it, they go, mm. there is something in this. Yeah. And I kind of just want to see what that something is. Yeah. And I keep finding more somethings to yeah. it. And so that gives me the sense that, other people are going to feel that way too. Mm. And so like, I, I want to invite a bunch of people that could see yeah. another something in it. Yeah. And uh, like, if it gets picked up or, or like, you know, we boost the dead and lovely collectives mm-hmm. name. And then, you know, if you like a year down the road um, or even if it's like building up a, a, a like a press stuff for getting grants and yeah. recordings mm-hmm. and, it's all a step further. Sure, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have, I have ambitions to be adapting the whole uh, divine comedy. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you were saying about mm-hmm. how a lot of times when these things fringe in India, it sort of pops up and then it goes away. Mm-hmm. Um, I often I often think about that. Like, mm-hmm. there's you know, people will rave about a thing and then we never hear about it again. Yeah. Um, and I almost feel. Like that's, we have a disposable nature for some of the fringe festivals. Like I just did that for fringe. I just right, did for, yeah. I just did that for. for, for so that was. And, an and sometimes it's better that, that way. Well, than I it mean, can be. the thing is that I think that sometimes you know, there's there's two kinds of fringe shows. There's the the show that you wrote and then tried to get into the fringe, mm-hmm. and then there's the show that you wrote because you got into the fringe. Right. You know, and I think sometimes maybe those ones are the more disposable ones because mm-hmm. it was like I wrote this for the thing. I mean, if you, you know? strike gold, you never oh, know fine. when but you're you going know, to. You don't know. Yeah. You don't know. But it, it's often like there have been things with, that I've seen and I've often wished, you know, I wish they would do that again. Yeah. Um, but or I you think, see a bunch of things that are like close. Yes. You know, it's if you like, would just like work on that. It could be this amazing thing. Oh, right? yeah. 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 I think it just ta- it takes a will, right? It takes... It takes a will to to keep working on it and not to be like, well, I did this thing and now it's done. Yeah, I'm pretty stubborn. I'm pretty <laughs> stubborn that way. And, like, there will be lots of things that, like, you know, I miss or yeah. or that the show doesn't have. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> this, I'm pretty hooked on this thing now. So I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do as much as I can for it. Well, I think that's an important thing. It's mm-hmm. an important thing to... to to sort of like commit to an idea and to commit to working on it. Like I worked on my solo show for like eight years before I performed it. So, you know, like once you have an idea, if you think there's something there, you keep plugging away at it until you get to the point where you're like, I got to do something with this, you know? Yeah. And, and if, and once you start doing something with it, you, you owe it to the time that you've put into it to keep doing something with it. Well, I mean, especially yeah. if it's something that's still, that you're not, it's like, if you really sit down with yourself and it's like, am I doing this because I'm just trying to like, uh, you know, justify all this yeah. time that I spent on it? Mm-hmm. Or am I doing this because I really am in love with it? Yeah. Like, am, yeah. is there something about this that still makes me curious, yeah. excited, or uh, like it, it, it leads me down a path to a development? Mm-hmm like my own personal development yeah. as well. Yeah. It's like, then th- those are a lot of good reasons to keep working on something. Cause yeah. for, for circles, it's like, I'm learning how to music direct. Right. I'm learning, like I'm learning way more about composition and for other instrument instrumentations, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what good writing is. And, and uh, like, as far as the script goes, I've never created a, a full script like this before. Right. 
and uh you know the list just goes on yeah and then like like i i'm like i ran auditions yeah in in the fall um don't you learn a shit ton from doing that oh my god yeah yeah like i think everybody should at some point run auditions for something well you just right. want to be like relax you know you just well, want yeah, to say but... stuff like that but then at the same time you get it yeah sitting... no absolutely yeah and then it's you also see how like it's not like you screwed up your audition and that's why you're not getting the part. Sometimes it's just like, that's not what they were looking for. Yeah. And it, and it has no it's indication nothing, of how talented you are. Nothing about your talent. It's mm. what they were, what, like what, they, as you said, what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. You, that idea of, um, uh, working on something because it still fires you rather than, because of all the time you've put into it. Yeah. I kind of feel like if you're just doing it because of the time you put into it, y you'll stop working on it. Yeah. Like you're, you'll tell yourself you're working on it, but your body is like, nah. <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. It's like, and eventually it just won't get done. But if you're like, if it fires you and you've put all this time into it and you keep like working on it, then like there's something there. There's something that you're exploring, you know? Yeah. And it's so neat how, how like that can turn into something really incredible yeah like the things that i'm discovering like <clears throat> i feel like up until this point i've done a lot of really unpolished raw mm -hmm. stuff mm -hmm. and it's like i i've always kind of seen myself as like I i've always felt like i was the guy just like throwing stuff at a wall yeah, yeah. and like just and there'll be some things that stick but it just looks like a big like mess of spaghetti and whatever mm -hmm. else you ate um <clears throat> and and now, like, really sitting down with something and developing it and, like, distilling it down, asking people, like, what does this sound like? Or, or yeah. like, with, with the script, like, just why is this person doing this or why is this person doing that? Yeah. And, and, like, arrangement-wise, getting to know, like, just getting to know these songs so well, yeah. too, and hearing so many people, dif different people play them or arrange them. Mm. It's just, like, you just learn so much about about what that piece is mm. so that you can eventually, I guess, I mean, the work never really ends, Yeah. but you, I think that, uh, the, the sense that I get after spending this time on it that I've spent so far is that you can eventually just understand how to frame your story and understand the roles that the music, the, the words, um, how the thing looks and then how you're marketing it, all of that mm -hmm. stuff. You just mm -hmm. kind of, kind of breaks down into being something kind of more simple. And it's just like, here you go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then it's, it's digestible and people can, can take mm -hmm. that in. Cause you understand that piece so well mm -hmm. and you can, uh, 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 Michael Mori at tapestry opera has been a, a mentor to me. And yeah. he said something along the lines of, um, <clears throat> uh, like frame what do you want your audience to see yeah that always freaked me out before i was always like i don't know yeah. like <laughs> whatever they want <laughs> you know yeah. and like that that to a certain extent yeah that war that's okay but you, you it has to be more focused than that and i'm learning that that's like that's not that's not artificial mm. That's okay. It's yeah. like that's that's what you want to do. That's what every good story has been. It's like from a lens, a very specific lens, mm -hmm. and uh, it shows you specific things. Yeah, uh, and takes you on that specific journey. What is the journey of your piece? Yeah, and like where where does it end up? Or like what's the development of that? Mm -hmm. And those things have all, I've always just been terrified of that because it's like I, I don't want that much responsibility <laughs> <laughs> or like. That overwhelms me. Of course, it's hard to it's hard to take that on, right? Mm -hmm. it, it can be really frightening to take that on. Like the question of like who's the audience for this piece is always like, um, right? People who want to see it, you know? It's like <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. When you, when you said that, I yeah. even felt it. It's like, of course, I got some answers there, but like I still felt it. There. But it's like, the first thing that like whenever you you get to marketing, that's the first thing that anybody. They, they say, so who's the audience for this piece? And you're like, uh, uh, people who go to things, you right. know, and that's not quite it. So you have no. to like dig a little further and find and try to figure it out. And, and that's a scary process that we as artists are often unprepared for mm -hmm. <laughs> because marketing is hard. I oh. think as we were talking oh, yeah. about, because we were, 
because uh, it's it's not a thing that I think we were ever prepared to do. Um, mm. To be like, you know, I know I don't know about when you were at theater school, but they taught me a lot of. I learned a lot about auditioning. I learned a lot about like investigating text, and I learned a lot about about performing. I learned about about truth and all this stuff, but I never learned about how to promote a show and how to talk about the stuff I was working on. Mm. Which is one of those. It's a difficult thing to do. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't think that these like, I, like multidisciplinary stuff. I don't think that, uh, I don't think that any one artistic skill is mutually exclusive. Mm. And I think that's another thing that was drawing me in the direction of acting mm. is like there's a fundamental thing about acting, like you said, it like actors typically. They got a whole uh, list of yeah. weird skills yeah. that they de- they've developed, and you have to problem solve constantly, mm-hmm. and because uh, it's just madness. Yeah, uh, doing it. Yeah, um, in the independent theater world, mm. um, I guess a little more cushy in film and TV. I guess for, I think for you know actors, what in, but, in uh, but I think that it's still mm. there's a lot of insanity. You know, you think about it as being cushy in film and television, but it's just as uncertain. And yeah, just, no. The only I, difference is that is that when you're doing a film, you maybe have a warm place to be and they feed you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what cushy is. That's to cushy. Me, I guess That's cushy. No. Like, maybe there's a shitty trailer <laughs> and an outhouse, and they're gonna feed you throughout the day. Yeah, and that's. That's cushy. Yeah, exactly. You know. Whoa, jeez. <laughs> That's like an umbrella in my drink. I know, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, like like what you were saying about bringing it back to marketing. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think that the skills that you learn, uh, I think that the skills that you learn as an artist um, can actually support you in the marketing Mm-hmm. realm i mean i'm not on a perfect stride with that at all but like they they can they can be helpful yeah they well absolutely they can yeah it's just you you have to get yourself into the headspace where that's a thing you can do yeah right you can you can talk about your work and you can you can put your work out there and you can promote your work you just have to be able to turn what you already have into the skill of being able to do that and you only do that by practicing it. Yeah, and giving you know? yourself permission. You know, yeah. like at the beginning, I was like, oh, I've got to take this photo. Yeah. For it. And then a part of myself is like, I'm throwing like, oh up God, in my mouth I, a little bit. Throw, yeah. Why am I doing this? Making it's myself yeah. sick. It's, but it's like, how are people going to know if you don't talk about it? And That is and, absolutely right. And a lot of performers, a lot of artistic people, they're pretty shy. Mm, you know, yeah. they don't want to sh- shove everything into your face. No. You know, like, because they, they don't like what, how that feels when it's being done to them. And it feels kind of fake or whatever. So it's like, how can you, how can you authentically be a champion of your own work? And, and that's like, it's a, not an easy thing to do. No. But it's like, when you're, when you're acting, mm-hmm. it's like you're, you're, you're doing something similar to that too. Yeah. You have a specific thing. It's just like you're being another person. Yeah. So it's maybe a little bit easier to do that. Yeah. It's like you're you might have to play a salesman or you everyone's like a salesman for their point. Yeah. And it's like so just like pull away your stuff about being worried about like I don't know, like I'm just gonna be a like a soulless promoter yeah. of, of things. It's like you don't but I think it doesn't people have to sense that. that, right? If it, if you're a soulless promoter, people feel that from you, right? Right. I think yeah. one of the most mm-hmm. important training grounds for learning how to promote your stuff is to is to is to is to be a fringe artist and to have to go and talk to people. Mm-hmm. It's fucking terrifying. Yeah. Like if I'm do if I'm at a fringe festival and I have to go talk about my show, you better believe if I'm if I'm in a line flyering, I just spent between fifteen and twenty w- minutes with my head between my knees. Trying not to hyperventilate before I did it. Yeah. But then I did it. Yeah. When you learn how to authentically talk about your show, which is talking about your work and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a brutal training ground, but it's 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 a good one to learn how to do that and to find your voice in talking to people, which you can hopefully then take to talking to people on social and mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and then you're just spreading the word of your of your show. Yeah. And if you believe, it's like, I think for a long time I, I was waiting uh, 
still times that I do this, it's like waiting for someone's validation or someone else's permission before it's like, oh, I need to get a grant before I start uh, doing this, or I need to get an award, or yeah. or someone else needs to say to me, like, constantly, you should do this show, or you should do yeah. this. It's like, well, what about my own sense of just the fact that I really want to do this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, this this means a lot. This means a lot to me. Yeah. <clears throat> And what if that's all the permission that I need to pursue it? Well, that's that's the thing is that that is all the permission that you need. And I think we do forget that. We wait for the permission of the grant, the award, the, mm. somebody saying, saying, this is good, do it. Mm. But nobody's going to, none of those things can happen if you don't put the work out there. No. Right? You can't get a grant if you haven't shown that you are capable of, like, creating the thing. No. So you have to at least have put some work into it before you get the grant. Yeah. So it's it all feeds into it. And if you're going to get... You give yourself the permission before anybody else gives you the permission. So You, you have to stake a claim yep. on, on your own, like, uh, validity as an artist. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's a really hard thing to do because you're constantly seeing things. It's like, oh, uh, I don't know. You, you compare yourself to, you know... It's like it, it doesn't make any sense to do it in some ways. It's like yeah. I'm not guaranteed any money. No. Uh, like I'm going to probably deal with a lot of rejection. And yeah. that's going to hurt like hell. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to have to do other things to supplement. And there's a lot of reasons against it. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but if you really just like sit down in the quiet with yourself, mm-hmm. it's like, like I realized that with the Dead and Lovely, the very first Dead and Lovely show, I just yeah. went. This makes my uh, this makes my life feel more worth living. Yeah, and it's like I, I'm not just doing this because like, you know, it's sort of fun to do a show. It just yeah. like, I mean, the fun part is totally part of it, but yeah. it just feels like it just feels fundamental to to who I am. It feeds you in a way that not doing it doesn't. Like Ex- right? exactly like. It isn't just because it's fun because we can have you can have fun doing all kinds of stuff that's not creating a show or performing, but putting your work out there and creating it feeds your soul in a way that that nothing else does. Yeah, and that's how you know that it's the it's the right thing. Well, yeah, and 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 it's I think that lots of like I see lots of talented people <clears throat> that I think feel that way to a certain extent, like. I see a lot of people that feel that way. Like you see them brighten up when they're doing their song or they're yeah. doing, you know, they're doing a show with their band. And yeah. then it's just really hard to like get up the gumption and to pick up and to be industrious about it because that's like, you know, that's a whole other headspace to yeah. be in most of the yeah. time. It's but hard. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is hard. Yeah. But it, uh, mm. oh, I just, I just really believe in that. That's good. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's why that's, what's well, probably going to be awesome. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. It's been a great talk. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This has been a Homebody Productions production.